I see the record came on. Okay, it did. Well, first of all, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, thank you for joining me uh, to chat a little bit about what we're going to talk about. I really appreciate it. You're quite welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Well, you know, I, it's funny because when, when Chuck Yeager passed away recently, it was big news, obviously. And there were lots of different social media posts. And, and somebody wrote me and said, hey, if you didn't know, Huntington Beach has, you know, a real legendary local, retired Lieutenant Colonel Maury Rosenberg, who obviously you, you uh, have a very distinguished Air Force career in Vietnam. You flew, was it 220 uh, sortie missions during the war? Yeah, actually, it was about 220, 29, but who's, you know, counting. <laughs> and uh, six, 69 missions over North Vietnam. The rest were uh, in, what they called in-country, which included Laos and South Vietnam and uh, a little bit of Cambodia that we're not supposed to talk about. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for your service. I think I speak on behalf of the whole Hidden Huntington Beach group. We, we love that, uh, you know, having heroes like you in the neighborhood is really a, a wonderful credit to our city. But what really got my attention was a friend reached out and said, you know, for those that are not that familiar with the SR-71, you've got this whole other um, flight history as a pilot with a, with a really special aircraft that I'm familiar with. But for those that aren't, how would you summarize the, the SR-71? Oh my gosh. It, um, it's a work of art. It's an engineering marvel, especially considering the era that it was, um, you know, devised and uh, put into service. Um, there's never been an airplane that's been built, the uh, engine, jet engine powered airplane that goes uh, higher or faster than I'm aware of. Uh, it uh, still holds all the speed records and so forth. I mean, we're they were basically, yeah, they were basically almost uh, handcrafted aircraft and uh, they all had a personality, the different aircraft you flew. It was, it was a thrill. Have you, now you put in, uh, you're, you're one obviously, obviously one of the top pilots of this beautiful plane. Did you, have you put in more hours or as many hours as anybody else? Uh, total hours, no. There's others that have more hours than I do. I think um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, there's a retired Lieutenant Colonel uh, B.C. Thomas, who uh, I think probably had close to 2,000 hours, maybe 1,500, 1,800, somewhere in that hour uh, frame. He had been an Edwards uh, test pilot graduate and uh, came to the SR-71 after that. And then the SR-71 program had a flight test out of uh, Palmdale mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he operated out a flight test for a while when he retired he actually worked on the b2 stealth bomber how many hours do you have in it I have uh, what do I have about 1100 I think it's uh, 1098 or something wow so getting back to Chuck Yeager now I believe it was your daughter that posted a photo of yourself and uh, your fellow uh, Air Force uh, you know, brethren there, uh, Jaeger, and you flew him in the SR-71, right? That's correct. The picture she posted, unlike the one you have on the screen right now, was the B model. There it is. And it has the raised rear cockpit. It has almost all the controls you need to fly the aircraft from the, from the back seat. Uh, and it was used in the uh, training phase. Well, tell us this photo here. T t tell us the story of this photo right here. Well, this was uh, after we uh, flew the uh, run, this, whatever you want to call it, the sortie, uh, we posed for a picture. And um, so they had closed the canopies so you get a better uh, shot of what the aircraft itself looks like. Mm. Um, the uh, General Yeager lived in the, or, well, yeah, he did live in the Grass Valley uh, area <clears throat> outside of Beale Air Force Base. And so when he was able to get a ride in this aircraft, you know, he just came in and uh, unlike other VIPs that flew in the aircraft, uh, he needed minimal training, obviously, and he'd already flown high altitude in pressure suits and everything. So it was sort of he and I getting acquainted and to, uh, to fill a square, so to speak, we went in the simulator and sat, sat in the aircraft, the simulator aircraft, and just did a few things. And we really just sort of chatted and talked about things. He's an interesting guy. Um, I had met him once before about 19, I'm trying to think, probably about 1968 or 9 when I was stationed in Japan after I was in Vietnam. 
Uh, he was the wing commander at Clark Air Base in the uh, Philippines. Oh. And he came to Yokota Air Base and was uh, doing some um, just presentations about flight test and his experiences. And that was the first time I, I ever met him. And um, here you're flying the man that broke the speed of sound. What was his reaction to flying in the plane with you, as you remember? I think it was <laughs> reflecting on it, I think it was totally enjoyable for him. Uh, I think in the lecture series that I've given, I mentioned about how he uh, is doing all the flying, really. And at some point when we're up at about 85,000 feet and a little over Mach 3, he says, Maury, take the airplane. And I'm just starting to scan the cockpit because there's no warning lights or anything. And I'm wondering what's going on. Is he okay? And so I said, yes, sir. And, and uh, he said, and he just sort of says this, golly gee. And he still had a West Virginia draw wherever he, I believe that's where he grew up. And I said, excuse me. And he, I guess, you know, he realized that uh, this is out of the ordinary and I'm wondering what's going on. And he says, my God, you can see forever. <laughs> and, I, and so there was wow. another, excuse me from him, or from me, excuse me. And he, he says, in flight test, you don't really get to look out much. <laughs> You're too busy with looking at the instruments and what's going on and mentally and physically recording things. <laughs> this was in the early 1980s, right? It was when we had the flight in the SR? Yeah. It was uh, 83. So he would have been... You know, about he had just turned uh, 60, I think. Wow. He was Not born in... More yeah. than a bit to go up and do this and, and handle it. Uh... Yeah, he was, he was born in 23, I believe. Right. In 23. Well, did you ever see him again after this, after you guys flew together? Um, I'm trying to remember. No, actually, I didn't. Um, I, uh, he was out at, uh, I, my last tour in the Air Force was at March Air Force Base. And um, I was the director of reconnaissance for 5th Air Force, or 15th Air Force, excuse me. And um, he was ha uh, coming through the base at one time, but I had, I was what they call TDY. I was on duty, I wasn't there, and I had his book, and I gave it to one of the uh, officers that worked for me in the office and said, if you get to see General Yeager, I said, he'll remember who I am and ask him if he would sign my book. <laughs> did you get it signed? I did. <laughs> well, what a, and you have it today, I hope. Yes. What a great yeah. artifact. Well, listen, Lieutenant Colonel, I would hope, you know, once things <clears throat> get back to normal and, public presentations can, can resume. Maybe the, we can arrange a way for you to give your talk here in Huntington Beach. I know people would be really interested. I would be first in line. Maybe I could help moderate it or something if you like, but if you're up for that, maybe we can plan that once, uh, again, once things get back to normal. Sure, I would be more than willing to do that. And again, thank you for your service and for sharing this wonderful anecdote about how you, you took <laughs> Chuck Eaker up. For, it was, was that his only flight in the SR-71? Yes, he, wow. uh, in, in all his other flight tests and stuff, he'd never gone over Mach 3. Incredible, just incredible. Yeah. By the way, on a personal note, when, you, when you're flying that plane, do, do, I always wonder about those kind of pilot experiences. Does your body fully adjust and adapt to a certain point where, I mean, how much do, were you feeling, you know, as opposed to when you first started flying it toward the, you know, the end of your tenure flying it? You know, do you, are there things you've always got to prepare for? Or does your body just slowly adapt and does it become almost normal at a certain point? Um, this airplane, some of the pilots called it the two second or the three second airplane. If you ignored it for two or three seconds, it'd bite you in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> but to answer your question, yeah, there's a lot of uh, training mentally that goes through your mind prior to a flight, you know, for preparation. And when you go through the training and you learn all the procedures, and you probably have over 100, 150 hours in the, in the simulator before you have your first flight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things become more natural, but it's still not the same until you're actually physically in the airplane. We can't really simulate that. I know that they have, you know, these uh, full motion simulators and right. wrapper and all that, but it, it's not the same until you're in the actual vehicle and doing what you're supposed to do. Fascinating. Well, again, Lieutenant Colonel, thank you very much. I look forward to talking to you again. And we'll do this in person in front of a large crowd here when we can, okay? 
That sounds great. Thanks for inviting me again, Chris.